Hello. Uh, I'm happy to be here uh, again at uh, the London Closurians. And today I'm going to reveal you a secret, the secret art of storytelling in programming. In other words, I'm going to tell you how to write code that is fun to read. If you like this talk or if you dislike, if you agree with the ideas that I'm going to share, or if you disagree, I invite you to share your thoughts on Twitter. And this is my Twitter handle. So <clears throat> chapter one, hard to read. Let me introduce you to Dave. Dave is a full stack JavaScript developer who works at Clafim, a Tel Aviv company that develops an online book search service. Dave is a good JavaScript developer. He masters all the subtleties of the language, like the differences between null and undefined, the quirks of this, as well as the nuances between double equal and triple equal. Dave really loves programming. He follows the gurus on Twitter. He reads Akio News every morning. And he regularly attends tech meetups. In short, Dave is passionate about programming, like you and me. Yet, Dave does not enjoy his work at Claffin. Why? Because on a daily basis, he has to work on code that looks like this. Long and boring code, code full of comments and low level details. This kind of code makes Dave want to hang its author except that sometimes the author of the code is none other than Dave himself. How many of you know developers like Dave? How many of you yourselves are Dave? I used to be a Dave until a couple of years ago, I got tired of suffering from this gap between my passion for programming and my boredom at work. My name is Yehonathan. I was born in Paris around 40 years ago. When I was a child, I hated reading. I couldn't read more than a few pages of a book without having this feeling of boredom causing me to yawn and close the book. However, I love stories. I love listening to the stories my father told me in the car on the way to school in the cold Parisian mornings. My mother, she was going crazy over my inability to read books. She was worried about my schooling. You know, in France in the 90s, reading books was really a big deal. My mother bought me all kinds of books, but nothing helped. Until the age of 15. What happened when I was 15? Well, I finished my first book. I managed to finish a book for the first time in my life. But it was not a book like the other. It was a choose your own adventure book. You know, those interactive adventure books in which at the end of each page, the reader, me, has to make a choice. Like for example, choosing between opening a secret door or stepping back. When I told my mother I finished the book, she was over the moon thinking she had finally found a cure for my aversion for books. But her joy was short-lived. Indeed, apart from this interactive book, I have not managed to read any other book. 
And fortunately, my experience with the cho Choose Your Own Adventure book was not a transformative experience. After completing my high school degree in France, somehow I completed my high school degree without reading books, I don't know how, I came to live in Israel where I studied engineering at the Technion in Haifa. For more than 20 years, I have worked as a developer in all kinds of companies with all kinds of programming languages, C++, Java, IRSA, uh, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, and Clojure. And no matter what the programming language was, even Clojure, Whenever I read long code, I experience the same kind of struggle I had as a child when I tried to read books. The same kind of struggle that Dave experiences at Clafim. I am bored in front of these endless lines of code, even when it's closure. And yet I love programming. I love programming, I really love. Once again, there is this mysterious gap. But maybe you don't experience this, the same difficulties as me reading books. Well, I envy you. But let me tell you about the next step of my journey as a developer, because I'm quite sure the struggle I'm going to tell you about will sound familiar to all of you, with no exception. Indeed, I am going to talk about contracts agreements, legal agreements. You see, around five years ago, I became an independent consultant. And part of my job is to sign contracts with my clients. Contracts like this one. For me, reading a contract is a nightmare. Literally a nightmare. So many irrelevant details that I have to get through. But I have no choice but reading the entire contract in order to make sure that I have not missed an important piece of information concerning the fees or the conditions of liability. And I am bored with it even more than reading code. Not you. Today, I'm here to share with you the secret behind these three kinds of struggle. Struggle with books, struggle with code, and struggle with contracts. I truly believe it's our responsibility as a community of developers to stop causing suffering to guys like Dave. How? by writing code in such a way that it is fun to read, as it should be. Let me tell you, tell you about a thought framework that I have discovered recently, and it is called, it is a framework created by psychologists, and it is called mind spans, in short, span. What is a span? So a span is an ancient unit of measure between the tip of your thumb and the tip of your little finger. It's around eight inches or 20 centimeters. It was used in the ancient times to measure many different things. It's interesting to note that over the years, the tools that uh, human, being, human beings have invented respect the span. For example, forks and knives, usually their length is around 20 centimeters. Same for door handles or frying pan hand handles. And if you think about it, if the frying pan handle was more than 20 centimeters, it would be very inconvenient to manipulate. And the same, if it was less than 20 centimeters, it will be also very uncomfortable to manipulate. So the tools that we build as human beings take into consideration the span of our body. In the same way, 
I'm going to claim that when we write code, we need to take into consideration our mind span. And at least three of them, memory span, attention span, and structure span. Let's explore first the memory span. Memory span is the, deals with the question, how many items can we handle in our short-term memory at ease? In order for you to get a feeling about this number, we are going to take two tests together. No pressure, no exam. It's just a personal test. Nobody will check you. So in the first test, I'm going to give you five, six letters. And at the end of the test, I will ask you to try to remember the six letters. Are you ready? I assume that yes. So here are the six letters. B, C, Y, T, K, X. Okay, now try to remember to in your head to tell again silently the six letters. B, C, Y, T, K, X. How does it feel to remind the six letters? For me, when I did a test like that, it was quite comfortable. I don't know if it's easy or difficult, but let's say it's quite comfortable. Now let's do a similar test with 10 letters. Again, are you ready? Yes. H, B, F, K, C, M, T, B, V, X, Now, try to remember the 10 letters. Unless you are a memory master or you are training or uh, you are gifted, I assume that it's very, very painful. Even if you make it, even if somehow you remember the 10 letters, I'm sure you struggle with it. It requires lots of effort and you probably frown when you try to remember the 10 letters. It was HBF, KCM, TBVX. So the purpose of those two tests was to give you a sense of the discovery that psychologists made that our memory span, span is around seven items. Usually a normal person can remember uh, quite easily seven letters, seven numbers, uh, seven items in a list of things to buy in the in the shop. License plate, car license plate, usually are made from of seven letters and uh, numbers. Phone numbers used to be with seven or more or less seven uh, seven numbers. So, to summarize, there is a span. There is a limitation of our memory uh, capabilities. That's the first one, the memory span. The second one that I like that I'd like to share with you is the attention span. Imagine you want to prepare for an exam. Imagine you want to read a technical book. Imagine you are listening to a talk. You don't really have to imagine because you are listening to a talk. What the psychologists have discovered is that our level of attention fluctuates through time. At the beginning, let's say for the, for the first 10 or 15 minutes, we are in the zone of primacy. And our level of attention is quite high. But after that, slowly but safely, our level of attention drops. We are entering the zone of, oh, worlds are here. We, 
listen to them, we are not well concentrated, it's very hard to keep our level of attention high. And when we know we are close to the end, to the end of the lesson or to the end of the chapter, we get another peak of attention. Mm -hmm. It is what psychologists call the zone of recency. And more or less, we are able to stay focused for 25 minutes or 30 minutes without too much of an effort. And there is a, a self-management technique that is very simple. It's called the Pomodoro technique that leverage, leverages this attention span. So Pomodoro is an Italian word that means tomato, as you have probably guessed. And I don't know if you remember, in some non-modern kitchens, we used to have this mechanical device in order to measure time. It's like a timer for various uh, cooking uh, tasks. So if your oven didn't have the option of switching off after 20 minutes, you could use a Pomodoro uh, timer. And according to the Pomodoro technique, Let's say you need to prepare for an exam and you evaluate that you are going to need four hours of learning. Instead of sitting at your desk and learning for uh, four hours in a straight way, you split the time into, into benches of 30 minutes. And after each bench of 30 minutes, you, you take a five minute break. And what happens is that when you come back for the break, your attention is rebooted and you are fresh again. You are entering again the zone of primacy. So you are always either in the zone of primacy or in the zone of recency. You avoid the zone of uh, The self span I'd like to mention is the structural span. And it has to do with how we organize complex structures or complex information. For example, usually in a big company, there is a hierarchy of roles. We have the CEO at the top and under the CEO, various vice presidents, VPs and group leaders and team leaders and then engineers, developers or QA engineers. And usually, what happens is that people that are in the same team share a common, common roles, roles that are at the same level of abstraction. It, it would be very weird if the CEO would have to manage both a VP sales and a QA engineer. Another thing that I would like you to notice is that there is a clear distinction uh, regarding how the information flows from top to bottom. For example, the CEO tells the VP of sales that we have to increase sales. That's the what. And then the VP of sales translates the what into the how. For example, they, they decide that they need to hire a new salesperson. That's the how. And the what becomes the how, the how becomes the what, the how, the how, etc. until it goes down to the to earth and to the actual uh, uh, doing. So the, the two important characteristics are same level of abstraction at a single level and a clear distinction between the what and the how. And it has to do with how our mind uh, operates with some limitation of our mind. This is what is called the structure span. We have seen three kinds of spans, memory spans. Seven items can be easily kept in our short-term memory. Attention span, we can stay focused for 25 minutes easily. And structure span, that it's easier when we make a clear distinction between the what and the how. I think that the HTML element called span borrows its, its name from this thing. I don't know if it's from the mind span or from the ancient uh, measurement unit, the span, but I think it has to do with that. Okay, 
We are around 20 minutes in our presentation. And according to my theory, you guys are entering the zone of, ah, your level of attention is starting to drop. What I'm going to do now is to reboot your attention to, by telling you a joke. And hopefully after you, the joke will behave as a break. And when the joke ends, your mind will be rebooted and we will continue the presentation and entering a new zone of primacy. Are you ready for a joke? Okay, that was the joke. Actually, there is no need to tell the joke. I was able to trick your mind by making it believe that I'm going to tell a joke and this expectation operates as a reboot of the attention span. So we can continue. Let me, for me, when I discovered this thing, the attention span, it was like a revelation because I, because I was able to understand why as a kid, I struggled so much with books and why the, I didn't struggle with the interactive books. Let's say the book is made of a hundred pages. For me, as a kid, reading a hundred pages was impossible. I would start and after a few lines, I would say, no, it's too much. My attention is lost. I was in the zone of, ah, uh, but, but with the interactive book, the fact that at the end of each page, I had to make a choice. This choice operated like a reboot for my attention. And in fact, instead of having to read a hundred pages one time, I had to read a hundred times one page. And this thing was possible for me. Let's analyze the struggle of contracts with the fact that they don't respect the structure span. Look at this contract. There are low level details mixed up with high level details. There are def term definitions mixed up with agreement clauses. I cannot skip to the interesting part. There is no way for me to see, okay, where is the fee? Where is the condition? Where are the conditions of liability? The only way is to read every line of this very long contract. Contracts are not written in a structured way. They don't respect the structure span. And that's why, or one reason why it's so hard for us, the non-lawyer uh, person among us to read contracts. I think that contracts are written in a complicated way on purpose in order for the lawyers to make money on us. Either so that we pay them to help us read contracts or that some of them can trick us and hide some little clauses that nobody can see, and then they can also make money out of it. But that's just a, an hypothesis. Now let's go back to the code that causes suffering to Dave. Uh, the function in, that I'd like to consider is a function that implements search. Where Dave works, there is a catalog that is represented as a hash map with books and authors. And there are options that are passed to the search query. And the options um, specifies whether we want the query to match the whole world uh, and how we want the, what fields we want to get back and what field should, you, should we use to sort back the results. And the function receives the catalog, the query string, and the option. And it returns an array of maps for the mat book that match the query, the books that match the query. Now let me illustrate or let me show you five, five ways that this kind of code challenges, challenges our mind span. So first of all, it's very long. 30 lines of code for a function is a lot. 
I don't know about you, but for me, when I read when I read code like that, when I get around here line eleven or twelve, I cannot remember what I read in line two or three. My memory span is not respected, so I have to read again and again, and it's uh, and then I struggle. Number two, there is this interplay between code and comments. So my mind has to go back and forth between reading code and reading English. And it's challenging for my mind. Number three, the what is mixed with the how. For example, here we have the filter function, which is high level. And we pass to the filter function something that is very low level, a regular expression. Here we use map, which is a high level function, and we pass to it a very low level kind of code that deal with string capitalization and concatenation. This doesn't respect the structure span because the what and the how are not clearly uh, separated. Number four, once you understand this code, you see that in fact, the flow of the code is quite obvious, is linear. First we search, then we enrich, then we sort, and finally we project, we pick some fields. So it's a very, very uh, simple data pipeline. But the structure of the algorithm is not reflected at all by the structure of the code. Finally, the scope of the code is not clear. Why do I mean by that? If you look at the code between line 18 and 22, that's the part of the code that, deal with, that deals with the sorting. Once you read those four lines, you realize that those four lines, the behavior of these, those lines is influenced only by two arguments, enriched books, and sorting options. But this is this fact, which is very precious and makes the code easier to understand, is not reflected by the structure of the code. So the scope is not clear. Let's summarize. This kind of coding style challenges mind spans. It challenges memory span because functions tend to be long. It challenges attention span because the flow is not clear and the is not explicit and the scope is not clear. And it challenges the structure span because the what is mixed with the how and the comments are interwined with the code. Is there a better way to write code? I am going to claim that yes. And like all the good things, we have to go back to the ancient time, to the 80s. There is this great quote from SICP, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. I think it's a provocative quote that says that programs must be written first for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. The first purpose of code is to convey ideas. If I were to paraphrase this quote in the context of 2022, I would say something like that. Nowadays, we have so many languages, so many libraries, so many frameworks that it's not challenging to make things work. The challenge is to write code in such a way that it's easy for a team of developers to maintain, to add new features, to debug, etc. The second revelation I had was when I read chapter three of this great book, at least the chapter is, three is great, book is called Clean Code by Uncle Bob. And in chapter three, he 
shares a couple of insights about how to write function in such a way that they are fun to read. In a sense, what comes next in my presentation is an elaboration of my understanding of chapter three of clean code. In a humoristic way, I have, I am the author of the fundamental theorem of code writing. And by the end of the talk, you will tell me if I was able to prove the theorem or not. But first, let me formulate the theorem. The theorem goes like that. Code that is written with respect to our, to our mind spans is fun to read. And for that, we have to respect three guidelines, quite simple. Guideline number one, we write small functions. Here, I have taken the 30 lines of the implementation of handle search query, and I have split it into small, into shorter functions, something very uh, mechanical that an IDE could do probably. Number two, every function body, every piece of the body of a function share the same level of abstraction. For example, here, I have filter, which is high level, and I am passing to filter a function, match query or code to a function. So it's also high level. It doesn't deal with how to check whether the query matches, the book matches the query or not. If I am interested into the implementation details of match query, I will go and explore the body of the function. But at the level of search books, I see something very simple, filter, match query. Number three, I am giving descriptive names to functions. And then it saves me the need to write comments. So instead of writing this piece of code deals with sort, I am creating a function that deals with sort. And the name of the function conveys the intent of the function. When I code like that, I barely need comments. Sometimes I need to write comments when the code is not, has some unexpected parts, some surprises, some tricky algorithm or walk around or deal with a bag in a third party library or stuff like that. But I'm not writing, I'm never, I never write comments that says what the code does. It's always about the why, not about the what and not about the how. And when we respect those three simple guidelines, we gain several benefits. The flow of the code is clear and explicit. You see here, even without knowing the, the implementation details of the algorithm, you can see that first we search, then we enrich, then we sort, then we select. Like you would draw a flow diagram. So the, the structure of the code reflects the structure of the algorithm. Number two, the scope of each piece of code or each group of lines is very clear. You remember a few slides ago, I told you that the behavior of sort was influenced only by sorting options and books, but you had to guess that or you had to analyze the code to discover that here, it's clear, you look at sort books and you see that the behavior of the two lines is influenced only by books and sorting options. Assuming that we don't have any global variables, but that's another concern. And the third benefit that we have is that when I explore code, I am free to decide whether I want to skip implementation details or to dive into implementation details. Like it's similar to how we work with debugger. 
but debugger is exploring the code at runtime. In a debugger, the two basic operations are step over or step into. Here I'm talking about analyzing the code at uh, static analysis of the code by human being. When the code is written with uh, small functions that have meaningful names, I have also this capability of quickly uh, being able to narrow down to the relevant part of the code, depending on the context and my needs. And it also, it's also helpful in terms of attention span, because every other line I have to make a decision whether I want to skip or to, to step into, like an interactive uh, book. Uh, let me show you how it looks like when I refactor the whole Handle search query according to those guidelines. Let's say I want there is a bug in the way we sort the results by fields. And I have to find where, where is the code that deals with that. So I'm starting from the top of the tree. Handle search query. And here I see search books, irrelevant, so I skip. And reach books, irrelevant. And then format books. Probably here we deal with the formatting and the sorting. So I go in format books. And here I see that first we sort and then we pick fields. Uh, I don't care about pick fields. I care about sorting books because I want to understand why the sorting book by field is broken. So I go into sort books. And here again, I see sort by field and maybe reverse. I don't care about maybe reverse. I care about sort by field. And here I have the code that I need to fix. So by having the my code written as a tree with small nodes, it gives me the ability to quickly narrow down, narrow down the context of my exploration. When we write code with this coding style, we respect the mind span. We respect our memory span because functions are small. We respect attention span because every two or three lines, the reader needs to be interactive and make a decision whether they want to step into or to step over. We respect the attention span because we have descriptive and meaningful names instead of comments. And we respect the structure span because we have a single level of abstraction per function. The scope is clear and the flow is explicit. How does it look like in practice? Does it work only in JavaScript or only in Clojure? Is it applicable to other languages? Is it forced by Clojure? Let's tackle first the question of the applicability to other languages. So in a language like Clojure or JavaScript, uh, it's very not, this coding style is very natural. And in fact, if you ask yourself what makes this coding style so natural in Clojure, you will come to the conclusion that it's the fact that Clojure is a data-oriented programming language. What does it mean to be a data-oriented programming language? or to follow the data-oriented programming paradigm. It means three things in this context. First of all, code is separated from data. We don't have objects that encapsulate code and data. Secondly, we don't use types to represent data. We just use maps. And finally, the maps are immutable. Why is it important in the context of the storytelling coding style. You see, when code is separated from data, all our functions are stateless. We don't access the this part of the object. So refactoring and creating many, many functions feels much more natural than having to deal with object methods. Secondly, when data is represented with map and not with type objects, when we need to take a 
long function and split it into shorter functions, we don't have to create new types for the argument of the functions that we create. So we are not penalized by our willing to refactor the code. And when the data is immutable, we can safely skip uh, function implementation and we don't have to ask ourselves, wait a minute, maybe inside the function, the data is mutated. So I cannot skip reading the implementation of the function. And that's the essence of data oriented programming. Code is separated from data. We use maps and the maps are immutable. Like many good things in life, we need to take all I have said with moderation. For example, if you create too many small functions, you will have another kind of complexity. Your code will be too nested and you will have to step into and step into and step into again and again until you can read a single line of meaningful code. So sometimes I will not create a new function for a piece of logic in order to avoid having a tree that is that has uh, a too big depth. Another issue is that sometimes I cannot come up with good names. And the name are ridiculous, like inner search or search to or search private or stuff like that. And usually when you are not able to give a proper name to a function, it's a sign that it's not good to have created the function. And finally, with regard to testing their pros and cons, on the one hand, when you split a big function into small functions, you can easily test each and every small function and the scope of each function is smaller, so it's easier to test. On the other hand, if for some reason you want to change the way the functions are organized, you will have to refactor not only the code, but also the test. And having to refactor the test when you refactor your code is a, is a code smell. So be careful with that. Finally, let me give you an advice. If for some reason for you, it's simpler to write code first in a flat way, do that. Write the code in a way that is the most natural for your mind. But after you are done and you see that the code works, don't be lazy. Refactor it into small functions so that it's easier to read later by other people or by a different ver version of you a month, a couple of months from now. Let me summarize what we have seen together today. So we, we have talked about storytelling in programming. And first we have investigated mind spans, memory span, attention span, and structure span. It's how our mind are wired and designed. There are things that are very, very hard to go beyond them. And even if you are a genius, and you are able to remember easily 20 items, you need to be uh, respectful of the limitation of the minds of your colleagues. The same with attention span and structure span. And if you want to write code that is fun to read, you have to respect the memory span. You have, you'd better writing small functions and you have to respect attention span and allow the reader to be interactive while reading the code, allow them to decide if they want to step in or step over. And please give descriptive names, meaningful names to your functions. And then you don't need comments. In terms of structure, make sure that inside the function, every piece of code belong to the same level of abstraction. And then automatically the flow of the algorithm is reflected by the code and the scope of the code is clear. In practice, this kind of, uh, this code style works well with the data oriented programming paradigm that is inevitable in closure, but is applicable in many other languages. 
if it's easier for you to write it a different way at the beginning, go for it. Write first the easy way and then refactor and take into consideration that sometimes if you go all the way with this coding style, you will have another kind of issues. Your function code will be too nested. You will have to come up with real names and sometimes it's challenging in terms of stating. So drink with moderation, please. Let me conclude the presentation with a few words of hope. I envision a day where books will be written in such a way that every kid on earth that likes stories can enjoy reading books. But maybe it's too much to ask for. So let me revise my expectation. I envision a day where agreements will be written like Wikipedia articles, short. And if I want to deep dive into, for example, what do they mean by services, I would click a link and I would see what it meant by services. And if I want to see what it meant in the context of this agreement by expertise, I can also uh, deep dive. But if I want to skip, I can skip. It might also too much to ask for such a thing to happen. So let me revise again my expectation. And I really envision a day, not too far in the future, where we write code that is fun to read. No more suffering for people like Dave that are passionate about programming. Every developer on earth that likes programming deserves to enjoy at work while reading code. Before we get to the discussion part, let me mention again the books that I used for this presentation. So Clean Code by Uncle Bob, Bob especially chapter three, Data-Oriented Programming by myself, and the illustrations from, of this presentation were drawn by my two beautiful daughters, Odaya and Adva. Um, the discussion is open 